kind of a funny thing. The neighbor was a rancher, but they had a lot of uh, invasive uh, Irish and um, uh, mustard plants came in and took over the grazing land. So the easiest way for them to eradicate it was to have it sprayed. So there was an old biplane over there and I hiked over in the morning very fascinated and the guy had a little problem getting it started and I'm like an eight year old kid and I said gee maybe the magnetos are wet we have that problem on a tractor if you pull the cap off and clean it it might start and he looked at me kind of funny so he pulled the magnetos apart dried them out and put it back on and it started and he says you know, that's pretty impressive for an eight-year-old kid. And I said, well, we'd have the problem with the tractor. So anyway, he finished up in a couple of hours and he offered to give me a ride. So I climbed in the hopper and went for a ride. And I went home, but I was really in tall cotton. I was, that's the best thing I ever done, chemicals and all, hanging on for dear life. Anyway, told my daddy about that. And my daddy decided that I needed an attitude adjustment. So I got a pretty good whopping. And I loved airplanes ever since. <laughs> Well, I've done three things of, I guess you could call it of note in aviation. So the first thing was in 1966, uh, I helped a guy fly a balloon across the United States. It was the Flight of the Lennox, that was the name of the balloon, and that was the main sponsor was Lennox Heating and Air Conditioning, hence the name. And uh, so I was his chief cook and bottle washer. Um, I went 18,000 feet in the balloon. And uh, Barnes went to 27,700 and set several altitude records for that. Well, when I was a kid in high school, I had joined uh, the Civil Air Patrol as a cadet. And so they, they had flying in and stuff. And so I got to fly um, with them as an observer and stuff, teenage observer. And uh, I remember down at National City Airport, they had like six T-6 Harvards. And uh, I remember riding in the back seat on those, sitting on a case of oil because the things were sold and it didn't stop and pour a lot of oil in it along with gasoline, but at least I could see out of the airplane pretty good. But, um, so I've always been involved with aviation, loved that part of it. Um, got married the first time and wife didn't want to do any flying, so that kind of came to a screeching halt for a while. Um, then uh, when I got unmarried, the first thing I did was build a hot air balloon and uh, my own called it lumpy. It didn't fly very good, but it, it did go up and down. That's about all I can say. Anyway, that was some grand adventures. And, uh, and there was a certain green-eyed blonde that was the instigator in that. And uh, so uh, that was pretty humorous because the guy said, how did you get into the school? How did you get the audio-visual carts out here? Because we needed extension cords to power the blower. And I said, oh, Patty Ann unlocked it. And he goes, that says all, and he just went stomping off. The poor guy, he was having a nervous breakdown. But anyway, I had a lot of fun with that. Um, so the next thing that comes along, I guess, would be the trip to Russia. And um, it was 1990, my friends were reading all this stuff, and they said, hey, this is right up your alley, you ought to look into it. So I called the guy up, and he had a, uh, he had a Bonanza for a support airplane with an N3N. N3N is the Navy version of the Stearman. It's one of the few airplanes that was built in the Naval Yard and it was all metal. Anyway, they had that modified to go. So I called up the kid and said, look, I'm a airframe and power plant mechanic and I have a Cessna 185 and that'll match the speeds a lot better. And so I talked myself into a job. Uh, unbeknownst to me, the kid didn't even have a pilot's license. So anyway, when all that came to a screeching surface, so to speak. Um, I reorganized the trip and six weeks to put it together. The Russians gave us an envelope, but we had all the paperwork done. And so that's how I did the trip in 1991, 62 days, 32 days in the Soviet Union. Basically the route was uh, across the United States, up north into Canada, up into Frobisher Bay, Frobisher Bay to Greenland, and then Greenland to Iceland, um, Iceland into the Stornoway Islands in Scotland, and then down to England, through Europe, um, through Eastern Russia, and then uh, 32 days in the Soviet Union was quite interesting. Uh, once we crossed the Ural Mountains, um, things got rather interesting. <coughs> the uh, 
it's all Asian, and I was surprised. I had studied Russian in college, but I had no idea that Russia is 11 time zones. It's dang near half the world. Anyway, it was a very cultural experience. I lost 32 pounds, hence the book and the video are called Victor for the Soviet aerobatic champion. He was world champion in 1982 in uh, aerobatics. He's also head coach of the Soviet aerobatic team, and that's spelled V-I-K-T-O-R. Vodka, we drank a liter of vodka a day, whether we needed to or not, in raw fish, and we ate some god-awful, terrible old dead carp, um, hence the loss of 23 pounds. But it was a grand adventure. And uh, then in 95 and 96, I had restored a Grumman HU-16C model, which is a short winger um, albatross, and it took me five years to take a derelict and build it up into a jokingly called a wingabago. But uh, it was, I can honestly say I think it's the only airplane with a washer and dryer in it. The interior weighed 5,400 pounds, two and a half tons, just in the interior. But it was all done in teak and black walnut. Then I spent 18 months flying it around the Pacific from the Arctic to the Antarctic and everything in between. We had a dive compressor on board. Um, it was a great way to travel. And um, so that kind of wraps up, I call three things of note. Um, now I'm more into antique airplanes. I was the first person to put a Hats biplane on floats. Um, everybody said it was too small and too squirrely. I had gone through uh, stage 4 2B cancer and um, so the joke was I had nothing to lose and uh, so I don't think it swayed my opinion that much but that was one of the most fun little airplanes I ever had called it Cloud Dancer. And then some guy in Florida put a little Mong, which is even a smaller biplane on floats. But um, the next follow-up from Cloud Dancer was kind of a proof of concept. I have a highly modified um, Starduster. The only thing left is the wings that really look like a Starduster, and they're the X-wing. I got the only set of X-wings left in the world for a Starduster. They're beefed up quite a bit. And custom-built fuselage. We have a 400 horse supercharged Russian on the front, 24 foot wingspan, swinging an eight foot prop. So there's some challenges to fly that thing. And um, it's, uh, I keep saying it's getting closer, but hopefully that will be in the air within a year or so. Memorable in the most vivid emotions or what scared the heck out of me the most or, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that make it. I think I've been very fortunate that uh, aviation has opened a tremendous amount of doors for me and exposed me to a lot of different aircraft to fly. Um, probably the most memorable is uh, I purchased a beautiful pre-World War II big engine stagger wing from Addison Pemberton so he could finish up his mail plane, uh, the Boeing. It's the only uh, oldest airliner flying in the world right now and uh, Addison is just the epitome of a gentleman of aviation. He's always has time to give people rides and talk to him and, and uh, you know it, it, uh, I'm proud to be his friend but I had his stagger wing for five years and that's probably the most challenging airplane to fly. Um, it was also very rewarding, but they have a very small tail and that pumpkin body shape, when the tail goes down, it blocks it, the fuselage, and you have no tail. So you, you better be headed down the runway and you steer the thing with differential ailerons and it's not flaps on the bottom, or excuse me, it's got flaps on the bottom wing, the top wing are the ailerons, but if you want to turn right, you roll in left aileron and the drag causes the airplane to swing because there is no wind going over the tail. And if you try to use the brakes, you might be successful. But if you're on a grass strip or something, it gets kind of interesting. But once I figured out how to fly it, it was pretty good. But <clears throat> the power curve was a little challenging on that one. Probably taking on severe weather without having good weather avoidance equipment. And uh, very fortunate, I uh, happened to be over Houston at about 27,000 feet in a Turbo 210 and headed into Lake Charles. And 
the 727s, that's how long ago that was, were diverting up to Wichita and places like that. And the guy said, do you want to go to Florida? And I said, no, I'm headed for Lake Charles. And there's two big thunder bumpers on each side of me, but there's 15 miles between them. So I slept down between the two of them, got into the clouds at 23,000 feet. Center comes up and said, you're headed for a cell, turn left and I dent. So brand new 210 to me. And uh, I twisted 90 degrees on the heading bug on the autopilot, reached up to push the ident button on the transponder and it was like I hit a concrete wall. My hand went right through the radio, crushed the front of the radio. Stuff was flying all over and the airplane was in for a ride. And uh, I chopped the power as hard on a turbocharged airplane, um, threw the landing gear out trying to stabilize it, but I went from 15,000 feet to 30,000 feet, seemed like in a nanosecond. Had problems with my oxygen mask getting, you know, jerked around and stuff. Anyway, it was a cultural experience. Finally got out of that, and I remember uh, shooting the approach into Lake Charles in heavy rain, and uh, I get the airplane on the ground, and the gas voice says, you know, I said, well, if you can fuel it, fine, and you can put it in a hangar, what's left of the poor airplane? But 210's a very strong airplane. They tend to break up at the flap aileron connection. That's the weak spot in the spar. But I think the thing that saved me on that trip was I had altitude hold off, I was descending, but I never took the autopilot off. If I had to have manually flown it, I don't know with the amount of vertigo and the lightning and the severity of the storm. And I'm not sure whether that was a level three or a level four, but it was one heck of a ride. And um, that taught me a very valuable lesson. I uh, went out and bought some weather avoidance equipment, uh, like a storm scope and a few things like that. Now you've got you know, all kinds of documentation, real live weather in the cockpit, et cetera, makes it a lot safer. But um, that was a sobering experience for me, or else the moral aim is to scared the Everland blank out of me. Yeah. <laughs>